You're listening to the Morphology Podcast. Hi, my name is Krista Kovacs, and I'm from Bloomington, Wisconsin. Thanks for tuning in to the Morphology Podcast, a.k.a. Murph here, to share interviews about biking experiences from cyclists who have pedaled to places all over. Each week, we will get to know new people and explore new destinations to ride your bike. And as you listen to these adventures, you may wonder, now why haven't I done that yet? Crystal Kovacs took the time to chat about her cycling experience on this week's episode. Crystal is a sponsored athlete who didn't really get into cycling until her 40s, and it only took a couple of rides to get her hooked. Along with countless bikepacking and single track adventures with her family, she's also participated in some pretty intense gravel and dirt races, such as Dirty Kanza, the Mata Hay single track race, and the Mid-South Land Run. Cycling has changed her in so many ways, she even describes life as before biking versus now. So here's my interview with Crystal. Enjoy. Well, hey Crystal, how's it going today? going great. How about where you are? Pretty good. I wanted to get you on the show to find out a little bit more about your biking history and uh, some of the adventures that you've been on. So hopefully the listeners are entertained as much as I hope I'm going to be. Awesome. Yeah. Well, why don't we start out by telling us a little bit about where you live in Wisconsin and what the cycling culture is like there. I live in the southwest part of Wisconsin, where the Wisconsin and Mississippi River meet. Mm. We're about five miles from Iowa as the crow flies, and about four miles from the river. So we live in the river bluffs. Our hills are about 500 feet tall, the bluffs are, and there's really not much flat area where we're from. It's pretty steep either direction. Um, The cycling community in our town, we are the only adults that ride bikes in our town. (laughs) So (laughs) there's no community, so to speak. I have done true no-drop group rides starting last year, and some of those ladies are still riding with us, so we are starting to build a community, but it's pretty non-existent right in our little nucleus. We get outside of it, we have some pretty great riding, Decora, Dubuque, La Crosse, Viroqua, all has cycling communities, and so we ride there frequently. And are you mostly on um, pavement, or I, like when I think of Wisconsin, I, I think of a lot of um, farm-to-market roads that probably, if, it, if I was in Iowa, they would be gravel, but they're blacktop there, is that true? Kind of. Um, the county that we are in has quite a bit of gravel. We mm. can drive or ride two miles from the house and not see another car for most of the day mm. and be on either chip seal or gravel. Um, it is very true. Iowa has far more gravel than we have. But we have two state parks within 20 miles of us, mm. and they have forest service roads in them that are gravel, so we ride there frequently. Oh, yeah. That sounds good. <clears throat> and it's just a interesting culture to not really have... <laughs> too many other adults that are out on their bikes that's crazy it is it is it has pros and cons i miss the social aspect of 2020 but um i think part of that is just because we don't really have a community in our home base right well is it true i read somewhere or saw online and you know you i can believe it or not believe it but is it true that you didn't get into cycling until you were well into adulthood oh that's very true Uh um (laughs) My husband wanted to buy a salsa via, and so when we were in New York on vacation with our children, I said, I don't, I don't understand why there are different bikes for different things, and I don't understand why you have to have this bike. So we went to a bike store. I was 42 at the time, mm. um, and we rode di- I rode different bikes that day. We ended up coming home with one, but it was so far out of my comfort zone, Kathy. I mean, I, I didn't know. <laughs> And I didn't, definitely didn't know that 2,000 people go to gravel races at a time. I mean, who knew? <laughs> but um, so we ended up buying a hybrid bike. Um, I grew up trail riding horses and packing horses back up into the mountains. And I figured out very shortly that road is not where my love is. It's dirt. And so we traded it in pretty quickly after we bought it for something that was more suited to me. But, yes, I was in my mid-40s. My children were early teens, late single digits. And we now do it as a family. So it was something I came late to the game, too. But I've really, really fallen in love with it. Oh, definitely. And the fact that you got the whole family on board, or your husband got the whole family on board, that's that's pretty impressive. It is. And when your teenage kids go somewhere with you, even at 17 and 18, and after the end of the week, and they come up and give you a hug and say thank you, (laughs) there's something that's right. Yeah, that's a rare. Um, So, you know, you think about before you experienced that first bike ride, you know, like how has the bicycle fit into your life or changed your life from then to now? 
Uh, it has completely changed our life. When someone looks at our photo albums, there was the pre-bike era, and then there's the bike era. Oh, wow. Um, so our vacations completely revolve around cycling now. Um, we try to take two weeks every summer and go somewhere in the United States in a national forest system and spend it with our children where we don't have any cell service, we don't have any communication with the outside world. That has completely changed. It was a throwback to when I was a kid packing horses, I think, mm-hmm. but to be able to go somewhere without child- with the children that there's no one else around, they get mom and Nick back and we get them back. Mm-hmm. And you can ask them, would you rather go somewhere to an amusement park and spend four days or go spend two weeks for the same amount of money? And they'll tell you two weeks every time, even as young adults. Um, so it changed our life in that way. I've lost over 100 pounds cycling. Wow. My husband has lost more. It has changed our life that way. I went from being a borderline diabetic um, to being completely drug-free. There's no, I still have COPD, but there's no, nothing holding us back down. Um, so, and we owe that to cycling. So it's been a huge change in our life and positive. We've met amazing people through it. It's totally revamped what we do. Right. And when you go on those cycling adventures with the family, are you guys like glamping or camping or hoteling? We don't hotel. Well, we did hotel one night this year in Yellowstone, outside of Yellowstone, because it was 40 degrees for a high and rain. Um, I can do rain. I can do cold, but together they're not much fun. We have a military trailer that has a rooftop tent on it, Mm. and we take that. We can go anywhere we want to go with it. We haul four bikes, and then the boys stay in a tent on their own. Nick has a daughter that also goes with us, some breed. So they can stay in their own tents, and then we stay in the trailer. We do bike pack with them also, so we'll load all the stuff up on the bikes oh, and fine. go yeah, to wherever we want to go. Mm-hmm. And um, the boys really love that. It's a different experience, and you become even more dependent on each other, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and we touched on this a little bit, but do you do most of your miles? You know, you mentioned that you like being off-road more so than on pavement, but where do you do most of your miles? Most of my miles are done in dirt, um, gravel, or single track. Mm. We don't have very much dedicated single track really close to us, back to the whole cycling community. But um, we do have single track in Viroqua, Decora. They're about 40 miles away. So I'll go ride single track there. That was how I started out after we first got bikes. Um, We actually went to Moab six months after buying bikes. (laughs) And that was an experience, but I learned a ton. We went to Sedona the same trip and rode single track. Um, the majority of my miles logged today are on gravel, Mm -hmm. double track roads. And back to Moab, what was that like? I'm actually heading there next month. And so that'll be my first time biking in Moab. Oh, Moab is special Mm. (laughs) (laughs) in so many ways. It really is. The environment is cool. The culture is cool. The landscape is jaw droppingly amazing. We have been several times. We're going back in November of this year to bike pack. We've ridden the White Worm Trail. And we've ridden quite a bit of single track there. It's worth the trip. And so, you know, you've said you've been to some national parks. You've been to Moab. Of course, you've toured around Iowa and Wisconsin. Um, has there been any other epic places the bicycle has taken you? We went to the Matahe. I wanted to try the Matahe when we first started. So Lutzen was my very first bike event ever. And <laughs> there's pictures of me standing there going, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and for those, we had fun. And, for those and we who, finished. And for those who don't know what Lutzen is, can you give a quick synopsis? Sure. Lutzen is a lifetime event, which Lifetime owns, Leadville, DK, and Lutzen Schwamagan. Um, it's a huge event. It's one of the qualifiers for Leadville. And they have modified ranges, le- levels, distances for all different riders. I rode the 19 and had a ball, but way, way outside of my comfort zone. Um, but totally rideable and for a starting event in the midwest it's a great event Mm -hmm. um and the 99er is equally as hard for the elite rider is my understanding anyway um so we did loops in the first event the next one was the matahe single track in north dakota someone told us that would be really fun and so we went there and did that and i loved it i did the 25 that year there and that was a butt kicker but i met a gentleman there who changed my view of cyclists. I did not know Paul coming into the event. Um, my husband had met him online. Paul, the Matahe is a point-to-point, so you have to drive your truck mm. right back to finish, and then you have to find a way back to your truck. 
Paul brought us back to our truck. He made sure at the start that I was able to get going. <laughs> I mean, I was really new. I still, I didn't have any kind of pedals that were special. I don't think I probably even had a chamois. When I came into the finish line, Paul walked down the finish line to shake my hand, Aww. which was something that even today when I ride, I'm like, be more like Paul, be more like Paul, be more like Paul. <laughs> um, but it's just little things like that that the cycling community has been so cool on. But I went to my husband and I said I want to ride the Matahe 150 when they came out with it, which is 150 miles of point to point. Um, Nick Yabara contacted me and said I would like to do it as a stage race. I would like more people to ride it, and would you be interested in trying it? And so we did. We rode it over six days. Um, the agreement with Nick, my husband, was that I would not ride it alone. Mm. I had to find someone to ride with me. So I contacted a friend of mine who was playing semi-pro soccer on the East Coast. I said, Brandon, <laughs> I know you don't ride bikes, but what do you think? <laughs> and so he bought a bike. Um, he rides bike all over on the East Coast now. He participates in multiple events a year, and that was kind of his kickoff into riding but that was a pretty epic event nice and if it's over six days um is it the actual route and it's just split up into six days and then you like camp along the way yes you oh, ride okay. from forest service campground to forest service campground more or less and then so we would ride nick would meet us at the forest service campgrounds and cook for us so we had sag um water is a huge concern on the matahe mm. and by having nick there we were able to have water so that was a huge help. But yeah, it that is one place that the sections of the Matahe are exactly as they are when Teddy Roosevelt was there. I mean, it has not been changed mm-hmm. at all. It's not bermed. It's Nick Ybarra mows it, uh, strangely, courageously enough. He mows 100 miles of it down and back so you can follow the mowed trail. And he does help the trail, but it's not it's not an urban single track trail. It's, it's raw and it's rugged. Wow. Um, and did you have a special bike for that? I rode my salsa spearfish on it. Oh, okay. A quick interruption to tell you this week's podcast is sponsored by Lizard Lips Lip Balm. These great lip balms contain natural ingredients, come in a variety of flavors, and you can choose certified organic or balms with sun protection. Check it out at lizardlips.net. Now back to the show. And you had mentioned, or at least you said, uh, DK, have you done the Dirty Kansa as well? I have. Ooh, tell I us did. about that. <laughs> I did DK the first time in 2018. I was signed up for the 100. It would have been my longest, my first year riding gravel, and it would have been my longest race. I made it to mile 60, and we turned into the wind. <laughs> mm. And we do not have long sustained winds here like they have in Kansas. And the joke I always say is Kansas needs more freaking trees. <laughs> 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 we turned into the wind, and it was so hot, Kathy, that... I quit drinking because I was frustrated, and then I got dehydrated. And so a rancher found me in the ditch, and I had called my husband, but he stayed with me, being the sweet man he was, until Nick got there and picked me up. But I think failure sometimes is the best jet fuel to success. Mm. So I came home from there hungry to go try again, and I went back in 2019 and rode the DK100, had a blast. It was hot again. (laughs) It wasn't always all that fun. But we wrote it, um, and when I came back in 19, I was a sponsored writer for Salsa, so that was also, there was different eyes on me, I felt, than what there were before without any pressure. So, yes, DK is really, really fun. And like you but mentioned, yeah. that's gravel, um, and also you mentioned it was fun, but it's more of like a type 2 fun, right? Like it's a... No, it's, it's a type 1 fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I, yeah, it... So when we went north on DK in 2019, I felt that the single track experience was a huge help because there were parts of it that weren't really gravel as we know gravel in mm. Wisconsin anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it was it's fun. I would recommend anyone go try it. A quick interruption to tell you this week's sponsor is Thirsty Pigs, a full-service mobile event company offering beer, wine, spirits, plus catering for any indoor or outdoor event. Check out more at thirstypigs.com. Now back to the show. How about any other organized rides that you haven't mentioned? I have done Mid-South and Land Run, Mid-South Land Run, twice. Um, Both times were a great experience. I got to experience it last year in the mud, Mm. which was to me, really, really fun. I'm not a fast rider, but I'm a slogger, so <laughs> mud kind of evened out the field, and I, I had a ball. I've ridden Barry Roubaix in Michigan, Derry Roubaix here at home. 
um, the Matahe, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. And those aren't, those aren't uh, easy races or rides to uh, be part of. No, no, it's a, as a new person coming into the sport, being in a pack leaving town is scary um, because you're totally dependent on your neighbor to not run into you, not knock you over, not roll over someone's water bottle. But there are also great support systems out there. When I've been stopped on the side of the road for whatever reason, um, I've never had anyone ride by and not say, can I help you? Oh, nice. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really supportive group. So, And I'm going to agree with you. I don't know. The thing that gets me uh, mentally when I'm riding a bike is wind. Like it's just, yep. you can't see it. It's just there. <laughs> it, you know, it'll sneak up on you because if it's behind you, you're like, I'm feeling so great riding my bike right now. And then yep. you take a turn and boom, it gets you. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it's not something, you know, I can train for being hot at home. I can train for being thirsty. I can train for all of that. We don't have that wind at home. Mm. So it's not something... I've learned that I can go. I can go to Dubuque and ride in the open, and get that exposure. That we we have trees here. <laughs> sure. I ride two miles, and we have. I'm in a tree lined road, mm-hmm. but I've learned to go somewhere else and find that because it is an essential part of it. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, COVID has kind of ruined 2020 plans. But did did you have some races or rides scheduled this year that you weren't able to participate in? Everyone except land runs so oh, far. Yeah. Gosh, what a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, how about any uh, great bike packing or biking adventures that you want to share that you've been on? We took the boys. Uh, my oldest is in the military. He's in basic training. Um, so this summer we took our youngest to Yellowstone. Hmm. We spent two weeks in the Wyoming, Montana area. We started out in the Bighorns and then went to the Gallatin National Forest and Yellowstone, and then back into the Gallatin. So we spent two weeks bikepacking with him. It was a trip of a lifetime for him. Yellowstone was always something he'd wanted to do. So I told him I had one more trip left, and one of the blessings of COVID is <laughs> that the national park system is not as overloaded with tour buses. Oh, as sure. Typical. So we got to experience parts of Yellowstone that would have been wall-to-wall people any other year, but pretty much just walking through them this year. So that was really great. We did that. I went to Michigan with two ladies who had never bike packed um, last month, and we just chose a long weekend. I rode the ferry over. They picked me up. We went into the Manistee National Forest. Mm. Um, Matt Acker had made a route for us, and so we rode that, and that was a really fun experience to get to see them do something totally different with their bikes. Um, my husband and I are headed to northern Wisconsin next week mm. for a bike packing trip. Um, we're going to ride a few miles, and then we're going to Moab again in November. Nice. So when you say bikepacking, you know, I'm sure p- listeners know that that means you are putting everything that you need on your bike, you know, for overnight, for camping, possibly for food and water as well. But are you, have you dialed in your backpacking uh, setup pretty well? Because I know when I go bikepacking, I am changing stuff up almost every time I ride. I wouldn't call mine dialed in, but I take pretty much the same stuff when I go. We have a sleep system from Big Agnes that really works well. Mm. Um, When I go alone, I have a tent. It's actually my son's tent when we go as a family, but I take my son's tent when I go alone. And that works really well. It all packs up compactly and light. Um, So, yeah, it's. I don't know that I would call it dialed in, but (laughs) it works. And we try to, when we go on our own, if possible, make sure we have water caches or we know where there's water along the way mm-hmm. so you don't have to carry so much water. Water's super heavy. Right, um, right. But food, dried food, you'd be amazed how good sugar tastes and <laughs> real food tastes when you come back after a week. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never realize when you have packaged food on your bike, you know, and after a long ride, you're like, oh my God, this is so good. But I bet right. if you ate the same thing... <laughs> In the comfort of your home, you would be like, what is this? Yeah, you would need it <laughs> salty and yeah, yuck. But it tastes good at the end of the day here, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, any, like, favorite places that you've been on a bike? Like, Yellowstone to me would probably be, I don't know, it might be on my top of my list if I have had that adventure. But any favorite or must-see places that you've been on your bike? 
Um, Yellowstone is gorgeous. Yeah. There's traffic, but the Gallatin, I always tell the kids, Yellowstone doesn't know where it starts and stops, and the Gallatin Forest doesn't know where it starts and stops. Mm. And they seamlessly all go together. And there are forest roads, Kathy, for miles in the Gallatin. There are bears, um, mm. and that changes that landscape a little bit for us as a family packing. If it was just Nick and I, and we were the only two in the tent, and I knew there wasn't a tent further away with my son in it, I would be more likely to bike pack further into the Gallatin than I was with Brett being with us, even though he's 17. Mm. Um, we did stay in a Forest Service cabin north of Yellowstone that was in the highest concentration of grizzly country in the lower 48. They had barbed wire over the door, over the windows. Holy moly. But, but it was beautiful. Um, we did ride bikes quite a bit in and out of that cabin and were really careful. But yes, Yellowstone is definitely one of them. Moab, Utah, Utah in general is one. Mm -hmm. um, I have ridden parts of the Wild West route. That's gorgeous. That was in Utah. The Matahe is beautiful. There's mm -hmm. a, so many beautiful places. We spent time in the Custer National Forest or mm -hmm. um, Black Hills National Forest. That's beautiful. I think like in, of course, people listening to this podcast are all into cycling because that's what it's about. But it's almost any place that, you know, let's say you drive every day a certain route. When you take the time to do the same route on a bicycle, it's amazing the beauty you find in, in almost any route, even if it's um, in the city. Yes, you're different. You're small. Yeah. I think when you go anywhere and you figure out how small you really are in the reality of the world, it's staggering. And it's so easy to do that on your bike. Um, I have done running also. <laughs> running for me does not work. Um, <laughs> I don't like running downhills. I really don't like running uphills. But on the bike, you get to experience all of that while totally looking around. And we've been on trips where I feel like all I do is go, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you have the time to be able yes. to look around, you know, while you're yeah. cycling. You have time to enjoy where you're at. Yeah. And you mentioned running. Uh, I have the exact same attitude about running. You know, I've tried it. It's just, it's just not for me. Um, but I will say when you're off pavement, you know, so like what you said, you're on trails. I have to watch my footing the whole time because I'm just so afraid I'm going to twist an ankle or, you know, break something. So I miss out on seeing all the beauty. So that's why biking is perfect. Yeah. I could not agree more. Yeah. Okay, so we know you have tons and tons of biking stories. Um, anything, like, funny or embarrassing that you would be willing to share? Sure. Right. I did Land Run 2019. It was a dry year. <laughs> there were nominal puddles. And right before the margarita stop, which is, I don't know, like mile 67 maybe, mm -hmm. I came around the corner and my son had went home. I was all by myself, so I was having the time of my life. Came around the corner and I saw a photographer. Oh. I thought, ooh, I'm going to get my picture. So I went down the hill off the bridge and there was a mud puddle. Oh. <laughs> and um, he was standing on the other side of the mud puddle and I even looked back over my shoulder as a photographer to see what was going to be in the background and it looked okay. So I hit the mud puddle fast and my bike disappeared. <laughs> I mean, it just disappeared. I popped up. I said, did you get it? <laughs> like, yeah, I got it. I was mud from head to toe. Now I was staying with two ultra athletes for salsa in the same condo and my joke when I left the house that day was I am not coming back to this house unless I finish because I'm not looking at you two right. unless I have a cast on my neck <laughs> so <laughs> I got out of the puddle I ripped my shifter off it didn't work anymore my brakes were smoked um I pushed my bike under the bridge to the margarita stand and those guys were well tanked yeah <laughs> I was muddy so then I pushed it as far as the salsa chase um, and I talked to the staff there. I said, I can literally, I can ride it as a single speed in granny gear. I said, I can literally walk faster than I can ride. I have no brakes. Oh, and so the decision then was to pull the plug. But <laughs> when I got back to the house, I'm like, Matt goes, what happened? I said, I rode into the puddle. He goes, yeah, we you don't do that crystal at events unless you can see how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. But no. the photograph, I mean, is the photograph yeah. framed in your home somewhere? It is. Yay. It's classic. <laughs> That's awesome. <It's> a classic. <laughs> that is great. Well, you've mentioned um, salsa a couple times that they sponsor you. Is that true? 
they do. Yeah, how did that get to be? Um, I approached Salsa and said, I don't think you market to me. <laughs> and yes, we do. No, you don't. Anyway, um, I'm so proud of Salsa that they were willing to step out of the box of what the normal athlete on marketing material is mm-hmm. for the cycling industry and take a chance on someone who wasn't normal body type, normal body size, normal body age, or not an ultra endurance athlete. And um, they did with me. And so that chance has, I hope, paid off well for them. But I told them, I said, your marketing, you know, your ultra endurance athletes are 1% or less of the entire cycling industry. Mm. And I make up 98% of it. You know, there's so many people out there like me who maybe were athletes at one time. Um, life got in the way. They aren't now. They're mothers, they're fathers, they're people with children. Mm-hmm. But we have money that we would like to spend. So market to us. Sell us a dream. So Salsa stepped out of the box. They took that chance. It's worked out well. It's a relationship that works for both parties. I'm eternally grateful to them. The inclusivity I have found in the bike world has been nothing but complete. I've never had anyone tell me you're not fast enough for that group set or, you know, we think you need to ride this bike here. Whatever I've wanted or asked for, I've received. Um, It's been amazing. Awesome. And you're so right because the percent of professional athletes is so small and the rest of us are the ones that, you know, spend the money on uh, all the fun parts of cycling and doing things that, you know, like put weight on our bikes and add bags and do all the fun stuff as far as adventures going. So you were, you were, you were spot on on that. Yes. And it's been, you know, and I approached Nick Legan with Shimano last year and um, we are kind of, you know, will it work? Will it not work? And Nick's like, yeah, it'll work. So, you know, and Shimano is another company that came on and it's just, it's great to be able to for people to be able to see someone that they can say, hey, if that woman can do that, I can do that. (laughs) Um, And I think that's so important because I think there are so many females anyway who come up to me at events and say, I didn't know if I could do this or not, but I saw a picture of you and I figured if you could do it, I could do it. That's what it's about. Um, We used to do, I started no drop group rides with Salsa in 2019. At major events, we did one at DK, one at Land Run, one at um, Berry Roubaix. And they were true no drop rides, Kathy. I mean, we only rode as slow as the last person rode. Mm. And at Barry Roubaix, there was a lady who kept saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She told me she was sorry 50 times before we got out of the parking lot, I think. Finally, I'm like, stop. Right. Stop. <laughs> You're not sorry. This is who this is for. She had never ridden on gravel. By the time we got back, she was flying down the hills going, wee. Oh. And her husband was smiling from ear to ear. But... If we can touch lives like that, that's what it's all about. I was going to say that is totally what it's all about. And hopefully, you know, that woman remembers the beginning of her day versus the end of her day. Yes. Wow. What, like, I guess we're on the topic. What advice would you give people who don't think they can get back into cycling or maybe want to? Because I think your story is amazing. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, getting back into cycling in your mid-40s. Or, or I should say early 40s. Um, and then also uh, the weight loss. I mean, that's incredible in itself because there's just so many other factors to life. And just to take one sport and then that transforms you is pretty amazing. I would tell them that when we first started cycling, we have a gun range that's ten mile, five miles one way away. When I rode to the gun range and back the first time, I thought I had rode to Mexico. <laughs> It was so far to me, but when Nick and I first started exercising, we would do short distances, and it was a big deal to us. Now, Mm -hmm. I know people who have been cycling a while would be like, that's nice. (laughs) I do that to warm up so I can actually go ride my bike, but that's not what it's about. It's only about your journey. It doesn't matter what someone else's journey is. Mm -hmm. It's about your journey, and my hashtag is my journey redefined me, Mm -hmm. and how true that is. You know, I mean... We, you can go to an event as a cyclist and be the last person across the line, and they'll still be there waiting for you at most events, most large events, and it doesn't make your day any less of an adventure or any less of anything than the guy who won. It's still your day, and you still cross the line. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, I mean, when I finished DK in 2019, Jay Peterberry came up to me. <laughs> he had finished the XL. I was finishing the 100. He still beat me in. And he came up and he gave me a hug. And I'm like, well, I, said, I was really slow. He's like, Crystal. <laughs> he goes, you were still out there working for all those hours? He goes, I'm proud of you. Yeah. And I wanted to cry. And it still gives me goosebumps. I was like, oh, thank you. He goes, no. He goes, I'm serious. He goes, you work just as hard as anyone else who rode that amount of time. So it's only about you. Uh, I love it. Which I think is so true. Yeah, it is. I mean, and the nice thing about the sport of uh, being on a bicycle is that it's something you have to do on your own. You have to pedal. Um, yep. But yet the community is, I've never experienced negativity in the cycling community. It's just everybody is helpful to everybody else. Yes, I agree with that. And one piece of advice I have is if a cyclist tells you they want to ride with you, it doesn't matter what you perceive that their level is, they want to ride with you. And they understand what that speed may or may not be. Mm-hmm. They're there to ride with you. And if they're not, if they leave you behind, find a new cyclist to ride with. But when they say they want to ride with you, my experience has been, that's really what they want to do. Yeah. It's not about speed. It's about spending that time with you on a bike, doing what they love and you love together. Oh, so true. Yeah. And, and each, you know, each time I'm on the bike, there are times when I want to go fast and there are times when I just want to do a mental recheck and look at flowers and trees and, yep. you know, go at yep. whatever speed uh, my body wants to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make it less wrong or any more wrong. Just yeah. What yeah. you want to do. Well, you mentioned some of the adventures you have coming up. Um, are you hopeful that in 2021 you can get back onto the uh, race circuit? I am hopeful. Yeah. Um, I hope. I think it remains to be seen yet. Um, my goal for 2021, if that does not all happen, or even if it does, I think I want to wi- ride the Wild West route mm. from Canada to Mexico. Um, so that's my goal for 2021. I will ride some of the 100-mile events. Um, that's also sponsors previous to that but for the summer that would be where I would like to be mm-hmm. and what I'd like to be doing and bike pack my way south well um you mentioned your sponsors which are salsa and shimano yes um anything else that you want to plug that you really feel is worth mentioning to the listeners I am riding with a k-light unit right now which Carrie was actually the very first person to sponsor me mm. um I have a dynamo hub on my bike and the k-light on the front and the back, which keeps me safe no matter where I go and what time I do it. So I have found that night riding is super fun, and I can thank Carrie for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a low fork on my cutthroat, and that takes all the chatter out of the road and keeps my hands and upper body happy, so that's a great thing. And we use Amp Lotion on our body. Um, Amp Human has sponsored us, and that has kept my legs and muscles happy this year, so... What a combination it has been, and chamois butter helps with the bits. You're you're kind of set up, head to toe. I am. <laughs> I'm well taken care of and loved. And the Dynamo Hub, uh, what was the brand of the lights? K-Light. K-Light. So the cool thing about the Dynamo Hub is that you are uh, creating your own energy by pedaling, and that's what keeps those lights on. So if people haven't experience that yet it's pretty amazing that you can just hop on your bike not even think about batteries or lights and when you need it they just they come on automatically based on you pedaling it is i am for crap at remembering to charge stuff (laughs) i'm horrible (laughs) i just am um so i have a cash battery on my bike at all times i have not brought any electronics into the house to charge them since I put the Dynamo Hub on the bike. Mm. If my Garmin gets low, I just charge it off the cache. And when it's charged up, I plug the cache battery back into the Dynamo again. But yes, as long as I'm pedaling and then it stays on for a couple minutes, if I need to stop somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know, to set up camp or it's one of the easiest upgrades to a bike that one of them I would most recommend. Yeah. Well, Crystal, I think that it's pretty obvious that you are pleased with your decision back in New York to get a bike and start biking. I am. I would do it again, only I would do it earlier in my life if I could do it again. Right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, and I look forward to uh, checking out on social media, finding out your next adventures. Sounds great. Thank you for the opportunity, Kathy.
Well, that's it for this week. Thank you, Crystal, for taking the time to chat. You are an inspiring woman who has done more on the bicycle in a short number of years than most will do in a lifetime. I know I've added Yellowstone to my list of places to go on my bike. And a shout out to her sponsors, Salsa Cycles, Shimano, K-Lite, Amp Lotion, and others who took a chance on an everyday normal yet extraordinary athlete. If you have a topic or the name of a cyclist you find interesting, email me at morphologypodcast at gmail.com. You can go to morphologypodcast.com to find good info. I also launched a YouTube channel. So if you want to see videos of some of the places I bike, check that out. I'll leave you with this quote from the unwritten book of morphology. This quote comes from today's guest, Crystal Kovacs. It's only about your journey. It doesn't matter what someone else's journey is. Think about it. Thank you.